If you were a plant, how would you evolve? Would you get bigger? Smaller? Middlier? Or would you ignore size altogether and just focus on something else? In the real world, plants go through a lot of stages, but we only care about three. Seed, seedling, and adult. Which we're going to define as a plant that's capable of reproduction. So, each of our plants starts life as a seed, and it will try and germinate every turn for 30 turns. If it fails, it dies. There are two key factors for success. First, the seed needs to be on a tile with water. And second, the tile needs to be a suitable temperature. Suitability is defined as follows. Each seed has an ideal temperature, and the tile's temperature needs to be within 10 degrees of that to have a chance at germination on a given turn. But we don't want to just fall off a cliff and say, here it germinates and here it doesn't. So, if the difference is 0 degrees, then there's a 10% chance of success. As the difference moves towards 10 degrees in either direction, that chance will scale accordingly. If 10% seems a little low, remember that seeds have 30 attempts to germinate, so the odds of success are actually pretty good, especially in a stable climate. Once the seed germinates, we check to see whether any of its stats have mutated. Our six mutatable stats are ideal temperature, lifespan, rate of growth, height, overground mass, and root mass. Now, you'll have to bear with me. I'm not a biologist, but I'll do my best. Plants capture light energy from the sun using chlorophyll, the green pigment in their cells, and absorb water from the soil through their roots. They also take in carbon dioxide from the air through tiny openings in their leaves called stomata. Light energy is used to convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. Plants then convert glucose into usable energy, or ATP, through cellular respiration, and this energy powers the metabolic activities that are necessary for growth and reproduction. ATP and cellular respiration is a series of metabolic is the primary energy carrier One of the nice things about a simulation is that you don't necessarily need to take every single step. We're not simulating all of science, so we can make some assumptions. For example, the key points here are that plants take in three resources, energy from the sun, water from the soil, and carbon dioxide from the air. Those resources are then converted into usable energy which powers growth and reproduction. We don't need to physically calculate how the plant does this. We're looking at evolutionary patterns and populations, so we can just assume that this part works. Furthermore, we don't yet have a mechanism to simulate air quality, so we can just assume that part works as well. The question for this experiment is therefore, assuming we start with a working plant and suitable levels of CO2, how might plant life evolve in a competitive environment? To answer this, we're going to need an environment, an energy water life cycle, and a system for mutation, growth, and reproduction. So we'll start with our tiles, which, as you may know, have a temperature that fluctuates over time based on factors like altitude, season, and latitude. Water is split into overground water for animals and underground water for plants. The maximum overground water on a tile is equal to its precipitation. The maximum underground water on a tile is 10 times this amount. Each turn, the tile gains an amount which is equal to its precipitation, of which 99% goes underground and 1% stays overground. Second, tiles now have a solar rating, which is based on altitude, latitude, season, precipitation, and a base value, which is a number I just made up. Our energy life cycle starts by setting a plant's maximum energy. We don't have a sophisticated system for energy storage yet, so we're just going to make this a function of mass. We then calculate the potential solar energy a plant can collect based on its overground mass and its solar power rating, but it's also affected by the plants around it. If a tile is more than half full, either because there's lots of little plants or a few big ones, then the plants on that tile start competing for energy based on their height, with taller plants receiving more. If the tile is 100% full, we're assuming that roots are bumping into each other, branches are tangling together, and so on. The plants are competing for space to such an extent that they're essentially killing each other. If this happens, then the plant's potential energy is divided by the tile's congestion penalty, which is pretty severe. We then take into account the tile's current temperature relative to the plant's ideal temperature and the plant's current level of hydration. The idea is that these factors would, amongst other things, cause leaves to wither and this would reduce a plant's ability to collect energy. Finally, we need to convert our collected energy into usable energy, which is pretty simple. There's quite a few papers on this and I may return to it in the future, but in summary, they tend to suggest that, on average, plants convert around 1-6% to of the total solar radiation they receive into chemical energy. 
We're just going to use 5% because it falls within these values and it's a nice round number. To calculate how much energy our plants are using, we'll go back to our old friend Kleiber's law for our base metabolism, because it's magic and it applies to everything. We then need to get our active energy, and this is determined by two factors, rate of growth and height. If you're wondering why the height component isn't just built into mass, there are two reasons. First, being really tall usually means you have a big trunk, which is essentially just mass that can't collect energy. And second, vertical transport takes more energy than horizontal transport because of gravity and hydraulic resistance. You can think of this like a bucket. If gain and burn result in a surplus, the volume in the bucket rises. If they result in a deficit, the volume in the bucket falls. It's a simple solution, but I like it because it's reminiscent of calories in versus calories out, which is a fundamental representation of energy transfer in organisms. If the pool reaches zero, then this means there's no energy left at all and the plant is dead. For water, we'll set our max hydration equal to 70% of a plant's total mass, and we'll then set our hydration multiplier for this turn, which is the factor that impacts energy. For hydration gain, potential water is based on root mass, assuming a tile has enough water to support that mass, but this is also impacted by temperature. If the current temperature on a tile is zero, then its water is frozen. Frozen water can't move, so plants on that tile get nothing. If the tile's temperature is above zero, then the plant's hydration gain is multiplied by the plant's temperature modifier, which is the same one we talked about earlier. And again we apply our congestion penalty. For burn, a little bit of water is used in the energy conversion process, but it's pretty insignificant. Plants primarily lose water through a process called transpiration, which we're going to make equal to our overground mass. But temperature plays a role here as well. Higher temperatures result in higher rates of transpiration, so we'll multiply our value by the current temperature on our tile. But there are plants that can deal with heat, so we'll also divide this value by our ideal temperature stat. Back to our bucket metaphor, the same rules apply with regard to surpluses, but an empty bucket won't kill the plant directly. Instead, there's a proportional impact on the plant's ability to collect energy, which can lead to its death. Each turn, a plant will grow based on some math that compares its rate of growth to its lifespan. Plants grow slowly at the start, rapidly in the middle, and then taper off again at the end. The steepness of the curve is determined by the relationship between rate of growth and lifespan. A high lifespan with a low rate of growth will look like this, and the reverse will look like this. So those are the key points. Let's run the sim and see what happens. Now, for anyone pulling their hair out at this mess of data at the side, don't worry. It's just something I like to display when I first start running sims so I can get some immediate feedback. Hmm, that's not right. One second. Okay, we made some changes, so let's talk through them. In addition to relative height, we now have relative overground mass and relative root mass, and all of these now contribute to tile congestion. This means there's no more when a tile is 50% full, this happens, and when it's 100% full, this happens. If a tile is full, plants compete overground and underground. Congestion is also affected by the number of plants in a tile, rather than just collective mass. The idea is that if a tile has hundreds of plants, they're gonna be small which means they're going to be competing for the same layer of soil, which is going to hurt them. Max hydration and max energy now scale with volume rather than being flat multiples of mass. Maybe somebody can correct me in the comments, but I believe this is more mathematically sound because water is stored in and ATP is produced by cells, and the number of cells in a plant scales with volume. We also have some changes to seeds, which now get 100 chances to germinate rather than 30. In perfect conditions, where they're at their ideal temperature with no congestion, seeds will have a 1% chance to germinate per turn. They also start with a little bit of energy now, which is more realistic. Finally, hydration burn now scales to the yield curve against overground mass. This is because I found some interesting papers which suggest that there is an inverse relationship between water use efficiency in plants and their rosette and leaf size. Okay, that was a lot of work. Let's do this again. Right, we have one more change. The amount of space per tile has been cut in half because I think this parameter was set too high. 
It might feel a bit artificial here since I'm essentially just fiddling with a number, but remember that tiles are an abstraction of real world space, so we need to apply reasonable parameters to that abstraction. The first thing to look at is our environment. We have three areas which, according to our Whitaker chart, should be suitable for rainforest biomes. We also have a significant amount of savanna, desert, and taiga, and small patches of tundra and temperate grassland. Finally, there's an area suitable for temperate deciduous forest up here, and there's some patches in this area as well, but I've made the colors a little too similar to our temperate rainforest. I'll fix that for next time, but for now we can just consider this an area that's suitable for temperate forest, and note that it's mostly rainforest. So let's fast forward for a bit and see what we can find. We'll track our height, root mass, and overground mass on this three-axis bubble chart that I made and that I'm way too proud of. And note that the size of the bubbles corresponds with the average congestion on tiles. I couldn't think of a way to represent rate of growth and lifespan on this chart, so we'll just make another. And we can put our population graph at the bottom here. Over the first 50,000 turns, our plants spread out with no real pattern. Without any competition and in the wake of completely untapped resources, they're able to succeed irrespective of how they evolve. However, as we approach 100,000 turns, clear patterns emerge. Our plants have trended smaller for all three aspects of size, but there is some variation. They're also favoring slower growth rates with longer lifespans. If we look at our causes of death up to this point, we can see that access to water is not a major issue. Lack of energy is a significant cause of death, but around 53% of our plants are living to their natural end. But it's around this time that things start to shift. The first point to note is that there's a complete reversal in the trend for all of our size stats, and the second is that lifespan really starts to take off, while the reduction in the rate of growth slows. So, what caused this to happen? If we inspect our charts, we can see that the changes correspond almost exactly with an increase in the average congestion per tile. In other words, as the world becomes busier, our plants evolve to a build that's more focused on the plants around them. There are two key advantages to being taller and more massive. First, it brings a relative advantage in terms of resource collection, since being taller and having more overground mass provides better access to light, and bigger roots provide more access to water. Second, and a little less obvious, although larger plants need more resources in absolute terms, they're more efficient on a per-resource basis due to Kleiber's Law and the volumetric scaling of water and energy storage. If we look at particular regions in our world, we'll see that the largest plants are more common in hotter, wetter regions, but they do seem fairly widespread. And one interesting thing I noticed was that they have this tendency to pop up randomly amongst a bunch of smaller plants. Although mutations are set really high in this simulation, it isn't possible for them to say double or triple in size in just one generation. And it's also only possible for plants to spread seeds in their immediate radius, so what's going on here? I think the answer is that some of these plants are reaching reproductive maturity, but they're never getting close to full maturity. In other words, I think these plants are more common than they first appear. We just don't see them because most exist as either saplings or young adults, and a small proportion grow to be giants. From here on out, things are pretty consistent. The most diverse region is our savanna, which was a little surprising given that, on Earth, rainforests have by far the most diverse populations. But I think this is probably a consequence of our world. Specifically, our savanna is more widespread in central stable latitudes, whereas our rainforests are either confined to smaller regions here, or subject to harsher seasonal conditions here. But one thing I found really interesting is that we actually did see a specialist build which diverged from everything else. It was one which had a much shorter lifespan, and it was almost entirely confined to our desert regions. I think the main reason for this is that living longer results in a longer time to reproduction. To counter this, plants could evolve to have an increased rate of growth, but this means an increased demand for resources. And in a resource-scarce desert environment, the trade-off is apparently too severe. We can see the population essentially level out, but it's still growing a little bit. And another interesting data point is our death trend. As you might expect, the primary cause of death continued to be age until congestion became a real issue. However, perhaps unexpectedly, this doesn't coincide with more water deaths or more energy deaths, which actually declined in this period. What this means is that, despite our population being much larger than it was at 100,000 turns, we're actually seeing fewer deaths per turn. And you might have guessed it already, but I think the culprit is this. Longer lifespans come with an aging population, which means that things just die less often. I really thought this is one of the cooler things that's happened during these simulations. It shows that no matter what I intend as the designer of this world, evolution is a kind of fundamental force which doesn't care about what I think. I spent a lot of time considering how plants might compete for energy, water, and some of the other resources that haven't been put in yet. But in the end, these were all secondary. Populations evolved to survive and reproduce, 
In our simulation, the primary killer was an energy or water. It was just old age, so the population evolved to correct this. Now, these simulations produce an insane amount of data, and I could spend months coming through it for particular points, but I think we have enough to answer our question, which I'll put on screen in case you forgot. So, here's the answer. Prior to significant competition, plants trend smaller, with longer lifespans and slower rates of growth. When competition arises, plants trend larger, with slightly lower rates of growth and much longer lifespans. The one notable exception to this was a small group of desert specialists that diverged from the rest of the population and favored shorter lifespans. Of course, there are a lot more questions we could ask, and I'd encourage you to discuss them in the comments or over on Discord. For example, why is it that even after 400,000 turns, we actually never saw a time where lifespan was decreasing on average? Again, the downside is that a long lifespan pushes up time to reproduction, but this did happen and it doesn't seem to have been a problem. What I'm most interested in is how our plants will evolve when we merge this simulation with our creature simulation. But that's a question for another time. Hey everyone, I have some exciting news. I have left my job. I'm not going into full-time content creation because YouTube can't pay the bills yet. But my goal is to shift the ratio from majority this to majority this while still prioritizing the well-being of my family. If you want to support me, the best thing you can do is watch my videos all the way through, hit like, and subscribe. If you want to go a little bit further, you can send a super thanks, or you can become a channel member for as little as 99p. Member benefits range from simple badges and behind-the-scenes content to source code for specified projects. Or, if for some reason you want to go crazy, which I wouldn't recommend to anyone, you can even choose new avatars to be added to the simulation. As always, please only consider giving me money if you're in a financially stable position. Thanks so much. I'll see you soon.